these are my own views and not those of the Fed uh, Bank in Chicago or the system. Um, and so the, the uh, question we take up in this, in this paper um, is one that was uh, you know, of interest, su substantial interest to uh, uh, monetary, excuse me, uh, macroeconomists and uh, monetary policymakers through um, uh, the 2000s and, 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 uh, and the most recent decade is uh, what, what are the links that tie the housing market to uh, household expenditure and household consumption. Um, and there's been a fair amount of work through periods of both uh, boom and bust uh, to show that there's really strong co-movement between uh, the housing market and, and household spending, particularly in durable categories related to the home as well as other durables like vehicle spending. Um, to, the, to this point in this literature, the main focus has been on housing wealth effects, either direct effects of housing wealth on your spending or, uh, or, or the effect of housing wealth uh, as, as collateral for borrowing and, and, and affecting your liquidity and spending in that way. Um, what we do in the paper uh, here is, is, is put forth a, a new channel, what we'll call the home purchase channel, uh, such that um, what's also co-moving substantially here during the housing cycle with home, home prices and housing wealth are, are actually home transactions. And, there's, and what we'll argue is that there's a fair amount of spending that's complementary to the home and that the occasion of, of buying a home uh, will generate a substantial amount of, of complementary spending, improvements on the home, fashioning it to your own tastes, as well as uh, spending on, on home-related durables, furniture, appliances, and so forth. Um, so we introduced this home purchase channel. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the interesting thing here is that not only did housing wealth move dramatically through these periods, but home purchases collapsed by about 50% from uh, the mid-2000s uh, 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 through the financial crisis and, and stayed low through the Great Recession. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got substantial move in tra transactions and we'll go through it. What we, what we find in the end is, um, you know, an estimate of a substantial amount of home related spending that's driven by uh, what, we, what we argue is this home purchase channel. Um, we're not going to get at other categories of durables like vehicle spending that they're also clearly important in terms of the business cycle and, uh, and potentially driven by the other aspects here of, of housing wealth and, and, and housing collateral. All right, and the, this is just uh, micro data. We'll plot, you know, we're going to take a micro approach to establishing this relationship. This is an event study, just a plot of the uh, dollar spending response in home related durables, so furnitures and appliances. And you just see this really, really strong pattern for this category as well as home improvements, where at time zero here, the date of the, the month of the uh, home transaction, you just see these very, very large spikes. The average home spending about $200 a month in these categories, and you get spending about five times that level and staying fairly high in the few months after the transactions before settling down um, 11 months you know, within the year, a year of the transaction. And you see, we'll look across other categories and think about what's going on in the period leading up to that. Um, in the end, we find these very, very large spikes consistent with the idea that you know, the home transaction is driving quite a bit of spending. So that's sort of at the, at the household level using the micro data and the, and the event of, of a home purchase among those that, that buy a home. It's also true in the aggregate data that you, know, you see this really strong relationship. In blue here, we've plotted um, uh, home sales, the, the number of uh, sales transactions. And you can see in the boom, they went uh, up by about 30%. And from the mid 2000s through the crisis and down through the Great Recession, there was a decline of about 50%, as I mentioned. Um, alongside that in red, we've plotted here and with, an, you know, as you can see in the aggregate relationship, a very nice kind of lagged uh, relationship here where the home durables improvement and maintenance spending, home related spending are increasing and decreasing uh, through the same period, again, with a bit of a lag. Um, in the aggregate data, of course, it's hard to tease apart what was related to the transaction versus the other uh, economic factors, including the variation in housing wealth that was, was go moving alongside home transactions. And what we'll, we'll try to do is use the micro data to try to pinpoint that mechanism and, and get around potential un unobserved and omitted variables. All right. And, and the, the home purchase channel that we have in mind, let's talk a little bit about why that might make sense, why it might show up. Let me talk a little bit about the theoretical background here, what you need to get this home purchase channel going. What we argue is basically that there's, you know, in, in, in the presence of search frictions, households can't find the exact home that's going to suit their tastes. Uh, along with substantial differences in preferences, you're going to have people, when they buy a home, it's going to be an occasion where they're going to want to, uh, uh, they can't find the perfect house for them, so they're going to want to customize the home and tailor it to their tastes upon uh, buying a home. So it's going to be repainting walls, putting in carpet, fixtures, remodeling the home uh, to, to suit their interests. Um, at the same time, also important as part of this is not just that you're going to make those uh, those. Uh, 
adjustments, but also uh, along with preference heterogeneity, that, that home's not gonna be suitable for the next individual, and a lot of these investments, not all of them for sure, are irreversible investments. So that new drywall you put in, the electrical improvements, the things you made uh, changes to are, are gonna be complements to the particular physical space. It's not something you can take with you. Uh, and, and again, it's not particularly necessarily valued by the next buyer of that property. Um, so that's, that's gonna be crucial here so that essentially you're not gonna take these investments with you uh, when you move to uh, a, a, a subsequent property. Um, and so th that's really the background we have in mind in terms of why households are, why you get all this spending in relation to, to home purchases and it's not just about uh, spending that you can then, of course, take with you to the next property and, and reduce your spending on the next, on the next home. Obviously, there's differences. Furniture is more, you know, uh, uh, portable. You can bring that with you. But even then, it's not always uh, clear that it's going to suit your new space that you move to. So just a preview of the findings. What we find um, is that when you, we find a substantial increase, about a, uh, a tripling of uh, home durable spending in the year following home purchase, a doubling of home improvement spending. We find some small offsetting effects in, in other non-home related durables. Vehicle spending dips a bit, but not nearly enough to offset the overall spending increases that we find related to the home. Um, not much going on in other spending categories. Uh, so kind of consistent with a stimulative effect of home purchase on overall spending. Uh, cumulative effect, we find about $5,000 within a year of purchase for primary residences. And if you take into account investment properties, second homes, vacation homes, and so forth, uh, the average across all transactions during our sample period of 2000 to 2013 is about $3,700 in the year following a sale. Um, in terms of aggregation, we kind of take these local, these microestimates, aggregate them up as in a partial equilibrium way to get a sense of what the overall impact on spending was. We find about $14 billion per year of reduced spending in the, in, the, in the bus period 2008 to 2011. That substantial drop in transactions sort of added up to uh, ultimately about um, uh, 15, anywhere in home, home, home improvements, about 15% of the aggregate decline in, in that category, uh, and about a third of the decline in home durables through that period. So it's certainly not the only thing going on in the aggregate um, in, in those spending categories, but we think a, a, a substantial effect. All right, a fair amount of work. I, I won't uh, uh, go through all the details here, but a fair amount of work, as I said, working through housing, wealth, and collateral effects, both theor theoretically and empirically, um, and uh, we're contributing to that literature, we hope. Um, what data sources do we use? We, um, we use microdata from the Consumer Expenditure Survey, uh, a, a nationally representative survey, about 30,000 households a year. Importantly here, we're going to have a rolling panel where households are coming into the survey every month and they participate for a 12-month period. So we're going to have a 12-month window on what they spend. Um, and within that, we've got detailed data on when, when they bought the home. So we're going to be able, able to time everybody's spending on a monthly basis. We'll observe what they spend across a variety of categories. We'll group them into, like I said, non-home durables, home durables, improvement and maintenance. So we were able to observe those detailed monthly expenditures and then time them relative to home purchase. Okay, and we're going to see people that have, that they're, they're spending for a 12 month period when they're three years out from purchase, just right after purchasing a home and so forth. An important kind of aspect of the survey design here is they don't track people when they move homes. So this is not going to be an event study in the sense of having people seeing them before they move home until from one home to the next. We're, they're basically, if they were in the consumer expenditure survey, they leave the survey upon moving. What we're basically going to see is people that come into the survey right after purchasing a home and those who come in a year, two years, three years later, and so forth. So we're going to see you after you've moved and then take advantage of the difference in spending we observed in, in, in um, um, the time since purchase. All right. In terms of seeing people before they move and whether there's activity um, uh, in their spending, whether it's intertemporal substitution, we're going to have some building permit data where we can track for a longer pre-period, basically track a home during the period before the sale as well as after a sale and see to, to what extent is there intertemporal substitution. Um, just some summary statistics. As I mentioned, the average spending in improvement and maintenance is about uh, $200 a month, $2,500 a year. Uh, home durables adds up to about $1,500 a year. And the, the sum of those two, it, it works out to about 70% of, of the non-home durables, primarily vehicle spending. All right, so it's a substantial amount of the durable spending of the household. And the total there of, of about $4,000 a year, it's about 10% of overall expenditures uh, among households that we have in the survey. All right, these things are lumpy. We're going to run all the analysis in, in logs and levels as well as looking into the 
just the incidence of spending, uh, since these are uh, just to make sure that we're not uh, seeing effects that are substantially driven by outliers. In terms of uh, home purchases, uh, households purchase homes uh, or have lived in their home, I should say, on average about 15 years, uh, about 6% of households have purchased in the last uh, 12 months. Uh, in terms of how frequently you see that. And then we do, as we saw in the overall purchases, uh, uh, varying over time, you do see substantial variation in that fraction through time. Um, we've got a fair amount of control variables at the household level, in some income and wealth measures, education, and then family structure variables, um, as well as uh, information on, on, on the home. So some information about the size of the home and, and characteristics, such as whether there's a swimming pool and so forth. So not super deep information, but uh, similar to what you'd have, a um, uh, subset of what you'd have, say, in deeds records. In addition, as I mentioned, to the consumer expenditure data, we're going to complement with this residential bur building permit data, which are uh, an interesting source. Um, a company called BuildFacts um, has compiled data from city and county building permitting agencies and measured at the level of the home um, what's the incidence of building permits and uh, where available, what's the estimated job cost on those, on those permits. Um, their coverage is about, it varies through the sample, it's growing through time, about 50% of U.S. homes are in coverage for this, the period we consider. Um, the permit count data, I, th I think, are quite strong. The estimated job cost is, is noisier. Um, so there's, nothing, that's, there's, sort, there's sort, nothing to guarantee that a contractor is reporting an accurate figure uh, on that. It's missing to some extent. So really, we're, we're focused a lot on the permit count. We've got some results on the estimated job cost, but I, I think the permit count data is more reliable. And then what types of permits uh, do you see? Building is the primary category. You'll see electrical, mechanical, and plumbing categories as well. Um, essentially, the, the, this differs a bit by, uh, based on the zoning in a local area, but for, generally for larger jobs, you're going to see permits required in order to make an improvement uh, or substantial change in the home. What we do is we draw um, from DataQuick uh, all homes uh, for that 2001-2013 period that had a sales transaction and then matched them by address to the build facts data, resulting in a quarterly panel on roughly 9 million homes uh, where we're able to observe for an you know, arbitrary period around the transaction what the uh, permitting activity was. So just, just an informational question here. Yeah. Is there variability across metropolitan areas that's notable with respect to permitting requirements? Yeah, there, absolutely there is. I mean, it's not something we've explored in this paper, but um, we, with, it, with the data, you, can, um, we, you could look into that in terms of the average. So the average, I mentioned earlier, they're generally larger jobs. The average um, uh, job cost conditional on a permit is like 43,000. So these are typically pretty substantial remodels, and, and that certainly varies by zoning jurisdiction. I, I, I don't have data to sort of convey exactly how much that varies, but it's something we can look into for sure. Um, over the sample period of about 13 years, the, typical, or the average home has uh, just under two permits. Um, uh, unconditionally, the spending per quarter in terms of estimated job costs is $630. Like I said, conditional on a permit, it's $43,000. So this is going to be a view on, you know, the, the consumer expenditure data is going to get at really routine maintenance and lower level spending. These data are going to get much more at larger jobs. And the raw data pretty much tell the story. I mean, I showed you the plot from the event study earlier. This is just plotting, uh, 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 summarizing the average spending in these different categories by time since purchase. So in the first quarter after purchase, home improvement spending is about $600, three times the average spending among people that are more than a year out from purchase. Um, in terms of home durables, there's an even sort of a larger jump in the first quarter, $858 versus the 120 average spending a year or more out. Um, these are just the raw data. Of course, there's a question of, um, you know, who's, who's sort of, what, what's driving this variation? Is it, is it the home sale or is it the fact that you've got people in this category, for example, el elderly people that just aren't going to do improvements and they don't tend to move as frequently? So we're going to try to address that through the regression analysis that I'll, I'll, I'll move on to uh, in, in a moment. Showing you the building permit data, we find, again, the same types of patterns, whether there's any permit, uh, the probability of a permit uh, jumps to about 7.7% from 2.6% when you're more than a year out. From, uh, from home purchase, all right? So you see, again, substantial jumps in, those, uh, in the permitting activity um, around home purchase. In terms of designing the empirical strategy and, and thinking through the way we, you know, to motivate the regressions we're gonna run, the things we're worried about here are unobserved heterogeneity. As I mentioned, 
elderly people that don't move and don't improve, is, is it the fact that, you know, you're, you, is age the unobserved variable that's driving the relationship that we see in the data, or is it, in fact, something that's causally related to home purchase? All right, so the failure to control for something like age would lead to an upwardly biased effect uh, of, of uh, purchases uh, uh, subsequent to, purchases or improvement subsequent to home purchase. All right, we're also worried about unobserved uh, shocks, for example, that might coincide with purchase. Shocks like unobserved financial or housing wealth that drive you to buy a home might also drive you to buy a new car, uh, purchase new furniture, and so forth. Shocks to, to wealth, changes to permanent income, these things can drive changes, both uh, cause you to move as well as cause you to spend money on the home and in other categories. So moving on, let me describe what we're going to do to try to address those issues. In terms of unobserved heterogeneity, we're going to use an event study design. Again, we're going to use the idea that focusing in particularly on those homes that home, homeowners that make, make a transaction, we're going to look at the spending profile over time related to the timing of that transaction. All right, and so if you're worried about elderly people generally spending less, we're going to be able to run specifications that take out a household fixed effect, where all the identifying variations coming from the household spending relative to their typical spending um, uh, within that period, and, and how, how is that explained by the time since home purchase? So are those households basically, after we take out uh, household fixed effect, are they spending substantially more in those months right around the home purchase? Again, the theory, this, the, the idea that we have is this is a, uh, a temporary effect, that there's a transitory effect. When you move into the home, you're going to spend a bunch of money in that first year. And that household fixed effect design is going to help us take out that unobserved heterogeneity, like differences in age, uh, points in the, uh, in, in the life cycle, and so forth. Uh, in terms of the unobserved shocks, now that event study doesn't deal with the fact that you, know, you get that wealth dropped on you and you're going to buy a new home and also spend a bunch on durables. That spending is naturally going to come around the same time as home purchase if the shocks come about recently. Uh, so the way we'll go about this is, is, is using a placebo test. So we'll, we're going to look at across different categories, as I said, not just home-related spending, which we have a story as to why it's naturally tied with the home purchase, as well as other categories, vehicle spending and other durables, such that if you thought the story here was wealth is driving durable spending as well as the home purchase, we're going to see that in the placebo test. We're going to see people spending a bunch more on vehicles at the same time. And, and, and the question to ask then is, are we going to see a shock where vehicle spending is boosted in that first three months after purchase, just like we see in the home-related spending? So we're going to use those placebo tests to try to get at this question of wealth effects in general. And obviously, it's of independent interest in terms of thinking about your overall spending, aggregating over not just the home-related spending, but these other categories as well. All right. So we've got these, uh, um, uh, to, to estimate this, uh, you know, use this event study design, we're going to estimate these dummies on months since purchase. We're able to go back, uh, let me describe a feature of the survey, we're able to go back three months before purchase and then up to 11 months after. The idea, as I said, is that you only observe the homeowner after they've moved to a new residence. We get some people that come in in the first month after they've moved, and we get to see three months of prior expenditures. So you do see a bit of a pre-period. Essentially, as households come into the survey month by month, that sample is going to get very thin. Three months prior to purchase, it grows two months prior to purchase, and then it's at a steady state at the month of purchase and thereafter. So we lose a little bit of power as we go back to the pre-period. But um, we, do, we are able to look, just so you know, you know why we only go back three months. It's related to that feature of the survey. All right, we're going to soak up variation with the, the covariance x. We're going to soak up variation that we, we, we see and can explain by differences in income, wealth, family structure, and so forth. And then I'll, I'll show you results where we, we just uh, control more flexibly with a household fixed effect. So in the top figure here, what I'm plotting here is log spending against months since home purchase, the coefficients that come out of that regression. Um, this is for home durables, um, furnitures, appl furniture, appliances, and so forth. What you see here is in the uh, time of purchase, you see a, a log response, an increase of about two log points, uh, slightly larger even in the one month after purchase and then settling down uh, by the end of the year. You see a bit of intertemporal substitution, kind of consistent with the idea that before you moved to that home, you were spending less in those categories at your prior residence. Um, and, but but the, the decrease in spending here um, is nowhere near as, as, as large as the cumulative increase that you see thereafter. Um, 
in terms of the control variables, the bottom panel shows you what we get out of the control variables. The lightly shaded lines at the top are the estimates without any controls. Layering in the controls knocks out a bit of uh, the response over the 12-month period. Um, the household fixed effects knocks out a bit more. Largely what's happening there is kind of a level shift downward across uh, the full 12-month period. Okay? And what we've presented up here is the fully controlled household fixed effects specification. So very similar patterns in terms of home, home durables in dollars and in incidents uh, with a little bit more noise in the estimate when you look in dollars given outliers in spending. Uh, but very, very similar spending responses, about a $1,000 increase relative to the uh, 120 uh, monthly average expenditure. So big increases early on. I'll show you what that all accumulates to uh, as we move along. This is looking at home improvement spending. The log spending responses are a bit smaller, uh, but still large, uh, about a one, one and a half log point increase uh, with a little bit more of a lag coming one month after, uh, after home purchase. Again, the controls have sort of a similar effect here, knocking down a little bit of the aggregate effect, but more so in the out months as opposed to the, uh, the time right at, at purchase. All right, and in dollars, similar, you get m m much bigger outliers here, which drives, as I said, the sample size gets quite thin three months before, so those are quite noisily estimated. We'll be able to do better with home improvements and the pre-period here when we lo look at the building permit data. And this is uh, just aggregating up total durable improvement spending, um, including other categories um, as well, and, 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 you, and you see those, uh, those patterns come through. So let me talk a, a little bit about caveats and issues to consider, things that are on our mind in terms of the analysis. Um, you know, one question we obviously have in mind is, is there intertemporal substitution? We're going to kind of attribute this large spending response after purchase to the home transaction, but our household's storing up and saving up for that for a long period of time before not spending money. Um, to some extent there, there's less overall stimulus, um, you know, in, in the year, say, around, around the purchase if you take into account that substitution. So that's certainly one thing to consider. Again, we'll use the building permits to look in that pre-period for a longer window. One important thing that we have in terms of the, 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 the data is that the counterfactuals that we're measuring here are the spending that you make relative to long-tenured homeowners. We're not able to include in the sample renters to provide a, a counterfactual there. So what we're thinking about here, the transitions that we're measuring are taking your spending to be, if you hadn't bought the home, you'd spend as if you were a longer-tenured homeowner. To some extent, I think we, we think that that would cause you to underestimate the spending response. The, the average spending, we can say, in the CE among renters on durables, obviously home improvements is very low. On durables, it's lower than for a typical homeowner. So we think, to some extent, this is causing us to overestimate the counterfactual spending for those homeowners that transition from being renters to owners. All right, We're not able to observe in the survey renters as they transition from one property to another, so we can't tell um, we can't separate in the data transitions that came from renter to ownership versus ownership to ownership. Okay, we just see the, um, we, we see them, uh, we just see that you've moved. I want to say a little bit about generalizability. Um, uh, it, 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 we want to be upfront about this. We're going to use this 2001 to 2013 sample period to make the estimates. So in terms of the spending responses we see, the estimates are, are, are based on the composition of buyers that we see through that period. So to the extent that that was a period where there was a lot of vacation purchases and, and non-owner occupants buying homes as investment properties, um, that's going to be reflected in the data and the estimates we come up with. Obviously, if you move to another period of time where you've got people transitioning as owner occupants from one property to another, you're going to get different overall average spending responses. We look at heterogeneity a bit in the paper because we're able to separate owner occupants from uh, investment properties and we do see spending differences. We summarize that in the paper. But again, in terms of the average responses, you know, we're going to make our, our, our aggregation in the same time period that we develop the estimates. As you move to different periods, these might not be the, the estimates you'd want to plug in if the composition of buyers changes. And one point we've looked into a little bit and, 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 and thought more and done some work on is this issue of net spending and scrappage of old durables. Uh, all right, and the question is whether those, that furniture that you buy at the new place, you're just selling some older furniture that somebody else is putting to use a, a, in, in their home. Um, we don't find any, any substantial income increases. The survey asked questions about whether you developed income from selling your old durables or appliances. We don't see any substantial changes in those income categories around home purchase, consistent with the idea that households aren't really getting substantial amounts of income from the, the resale of, 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 and scrappage of their, their older durables. 
All right, so that, the, the, to the extent we're able to, to look into that and address that, it doesn't look like that's a substantial um, uh, mode of trend, uh, uh, substitution in terms of the, the, the durable st still being put in place and used somewhere else uh, by, by a different household. And of course, in, in that case, if they're putting it to use that way, they're, they're not spending on other, on other durables. The building permitting activity here, uh, as I said, we can look at a longer window. These are going to be on a quarterly basis, and we've got here the uh, incidence of building permits, the probability of having any building permit around home transaction. The big spike here is happening uh, in the month of and the month after the home purchase. Uh, you can see uh, the probability uh, increasing by six percentage points from a baseline of around one uh, percent, percent probability of an improvement. Uh, so big spending responses. And interestingly, what you see here is basically no lead up. There's no intertemporal substitution in the lead up to the home sale. If anything, that property is improved at a slightly higher rate. Okay, so you can see the slightly positive response starting here three months, two months, and one month prior to the sale. It's consistent basically with certainly this wouldn't be true of every homeowner or home seller, but on average, home sellers are improving their property before selling it, fixing it up to sell. All right, so to some extent, you know, what we see, at least in the improvement data, is not evidence of intertemporal substitution to worry about, but more so that there's, there's a real response in terms of homeowners that are going to transact or sell that are building up toward that, actually doing improvements at a higher rate as well. All right, so reinforcing to some extent, with much smaller magnitude, obviously, what happens after purchase by the new owner. You see the same patterns in log of, of, of the estimated uh, job cost. As I said, so that was sort of the, 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 the attempt to sort of think about this intertemporal substitution. To, you know, at least in those categories, we don't find big substitution over time from before the purchase to after, after the purchase. All right. I, I mentioned the placebo test earlier. These are looking into non-home durable spending. So this is primarily, ve primarily vehicle spending. This is in logs. And what you see is leading up to the purchase, a bit of a decline in those categories, but really not much. A little bit of a decline in the, in the month of purchase, not much going on thereafter. All right. In dollars, similarly, these are not of substantial magnitudes. Aggregating this up, as we'll do later, knocks off about um, uh, $900 of the first year spending relative to the 5,900 average response that we see in the home durable categories. So a little bit of substitution, particularly in the period leading up to purchase, but not much in general. And certainly the pattern here is not consistent with a wealth effect having driven the, the home durable spending that we saw. In other words, we don't see a big spike co coincident with the home purchase in, in non-home durable spending, which you might have expected if households had, had, had much more permanent income or wealth at that point in time. I think other studies of housing wealth seem, seem to show that, that those types of shocks are spread out over all, uh, all categories. So I think what we know from other studies is that households don't seem to think of it in, in the sense of uh, um, uh, it's not like a, a mental accounting in the sense that you got a housing wealth shock and you only spend it on housing. So I think what we know from the other literature is you wouldn't have expected the wealth effect to be so local. But you're absolutely right. To the extent you got a wealth effect in housing and you only spend it on housing, this test doesn't address that type of uh, omitted variable. We, we rely more on sort of what others have seen with housing wealth, um, that that wouldn't have been what you predicted. Okay. Um, food spending, a little, it's less elastic, clearly, but we, in general, to income or wealth, but we don't really find any action there. There's nothing going on around, around home purchase, no changes. I mentioned heterogeneity earlier. One interesting thing uh, that we can look into is, is patterns in the uh, housing boom and housing bust, basically the first half and second half of our sample. We don't find uh, too dramatic of differences. Uh, if anything, we find a little bit more spending in the, in the bust, the black line here, than we do in the boom in relation to home purchase. And that's largely uh, focused here on home improvement spending as, a home, as opposed to home durables. Those differences you know, might be consistent with um, uh, households uh, in the bus buying homes that, that had more deferred maintenance. In terms of the cumulative effects, what we've plotted here is just the cumulative spending in the year, uh, in the three months before and up to a year after home purchase. And you can see the, the cumulative effect, uh, spending on home improvements is about 3,500, about 2,400 on home durables, 5,900 in total, and as I mentioned, about $900 decline in the non-home durable category. All right, the overall spending, and these are for owner occupants, is about $5,000 in the year following home purchase. $3,700 is the estimate if we include all purchases, including investment properties in addition to owner occupant purchases. All right. What we'll explore now is, is, is thinking about some implications of this channel, thinking about how big the aggregate effect is, 
and the relationship with other effects that work through home prices. So something that we'd want to highlight when you think about the different channels through which the housing market affects spending is there's really strong correlation uh, about 0.7 to uh, 0.8 in terms of the number of sales that are happening in the aggregate over time and the overall uh, um, various measures of, of home prices. All right, so home prices are strongly correlated with home transactions. Um, you see that uh, through both periods of boom and bust. Uh, so what we'd, what we'd point out is that when you're thinking about changes in home values, they tend to coincide with changes in home, home transactions uh, quite, quite strongly. And that's across most markets. I guess LA stands out as a bit of an outlier. This most, more recent price, price boom didn't coincide with a boom in sales uh, nearly to the same degree as you saw in other markets like Las Vegas, uh, Hartford, New York, for example. Something like the size instrument, interestingly, would predict uh, changes both in housing wealth and home prices as well as changes in home transactions. The first panel here shows a regression of the, the log change in home prices against the size instrument. You get that relationship that uh, others have made use of in studying housing wealth, that negative relationship um, um, between uh, relating elasticity to changes in home prices. You get the same negative relationship with a slightly um, uh, weaker statistical result, but still statistically significant when you look into changes in volume. So I guess importantly, when you think about using that instrument, you're going to be picking up both channels. You're going to be picking up spending related to housing transactions as well as housing wealth. All right. I'll do a bit on aggregation before, before concluding. Like I said, we see the average spending response for all transactions in that sample period of 2001 to 2013 being $3,700 over that period of time. What we do here is a back of the envelope calculation multiplying by the change in total home sales. Okay? We're going to aggregate up in a very partial equilibrium way. We're not going to think about any further spending that came from the income to real estate brokers and others involved in the construction industry and so forth. We're just going to aggregate up our micro estimates, that spending response we saw. So we're not including any of that indirect spending that might come about uh, from, from other sectors involved in the housing market that are also uh, benefiting through this period. We get more explanatory power out of the bu uh, bust than we do out of the boom. So just summarizing, we look in different periods. If we look at the aggregate change in durable spending in different categories from 2000 to 2005, we think we pick other endpoints just to, 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 to see how robust it is to the choice of endpoints. What we see is our estimate of the decline in transactions would, would explain about 10% of the boom in the increase in home durable spending from 2000 to 2005. We don't get anything in non-home durables. Obviously, it's not a category that we're predicting any increased spending. Home improvements and maintenance, again, is about 8 to 10% um, in, in terms of that home-related spending. So the two home-related categories are in the, in, in the neighborhood of 10% of the increase is explained by this home purchase channel. In the bus, we get more explanatory power. We see about anywhere from 20 to 40% or 39% of the decline in spending could be explained by the home purchase channel. That is to say, the aggregate decline, we can explain about 20 to 40% of that in home durables. In home improvements and maintenance, our estimates are able to explain about 15 to 20%, depending on the precise endpoints. Okay. Um, thinking about the aggregation exercises in dollars, what we add up to, as I mentioned in the preview of the findings, we get about 14.3 billion decline in spending per year. If you compare it to sort of other estimates of this period, the Mian and Sufi work, for example, they were obviously getting a lot of power. They were explaining changes in vehicle spending as well. So to be clear, we're not getting that. If we compare the importance of our channel to what they see coming from housing wealth, they get about a $60 billion decline in non-auto durables, including these home-related categories. Our effect, aggregating up over that period of time, we get about two-thirds of that effect. Okay, so in terms of the home-related spending, um, we, we, you know, our, that, that calculation suggests that the uh, home purchase channel is, is uh, of similar magnitude, but a bit smaller than the housing wealth channel. But certainly, the housing wealth proved to be important for a broader category of spending, uh, vehicle, vehicle spending as well, and, and, and also uh, non-durable spending. Um, so that's really the story, just to be clear here, we're talking about is stuff that's relevant to the housing market and housing spending. It's not so much spreading into these other categories of durables that are important in the macro economy. So I'll just wrap up then. Um, we introduced and quantify this new channel, this home purchase channel. 
uh, by which when you buy a home, you're going to spend a fair amount of money to tailor it to your tastes. Um, cumulative spending, the, the spending effects are large for the homeowners uh, that we observe making transactions in our sample, uh, in the building permit data as well. Aggregating it up, it looks like it's meaningful in terms of the activity in the housing market. Uh, smaller, of course, in terms of the overall macro economy. Um, that's, that's the uh, results we have. So first, thanks very much for the invitation to uh, participate in this great conference. It's always nice when one can do some participation so close to home. Um, OK, let me just back up again and, and kind of uh, recapitulate what I think the motivation for uh, why Brian and his co-authors uh, decided to embark on this, this project. Um, I mean, there's this really large and, uh, and extremely important literature linking consumption to the housing market. When house prices go up, um, current owners experience positive wealth shocks. Um, when house prices go um, up, current owners um, have collateral constraints that relax. And because of these two things, uh, there can be large effects on consumption. Um, and the common channel here for a lot of this work, and I won't cite all the papers, Brian did a good job covering them is that this kind of operates through the price level of housing, right? And what they're going to do in this paper is say, well, wait a second, there's another channel that's kind of distinct from this price channel, which is just about the fact that when I buy a new house, um, it can have a big effect on consumption of complementary goods. So I get into a new house, um, I need new furniture, I need the sofa to fit my new living room, um, I might need to replace some appliances, I might need to do some renovations, and the nice thing about this channel, I think, vis-a-vis um, -vis the existing literature, is that it's, it's not really about um, price levels. It's just about um, turnover in the housing market. It's just about moving. Right? So we could think that it could operate even um, outside of boom and bust, just when we think about other things that affect uh, turnover, like increasing mobility of workers across regions. And I think that the, the picture that I, I like the best from the paper that kind of points out how big these effects can be is this picture that puts all of the different kinds of consumptions together in one plot and looks at the marginal spending response to purchase. And what just kind of jumps out is this big jump in home durables relative to basically a flat response to um, food, although I found it kind of interesting that what's going on, I mean, I would have thought food would have been totally flat. Maybe this is just lack of power um, here. Uh, that food kind of increases until you buy the house. And maybe oh, that's non-home durables. Oh, and food is fine. OK, non-home durables. OK, got it. That's, that's the problem with dashes. That, yeah, yeah. OK, good. Uh, yeah, OK, thank you for putting that out. All right. OK. Anyway, um, and you can see uh, home improvement also has a big, um, big spike. OK, and like, this is just a kind of um, a graphical way of, of pointing this out. And the, the authors are going to go through great lengths um, to convincingly identify this effect. And I'm not really going to quibble um, at all with their identification strategy. I think this kind of idea that they have within household variation identifying these responses, fairly convincing. It's, it's got the, um, the advantage that it's very simple and easy to understand. And at the same time, it's very powerful. So I'm going to take at face value all of these estimates. I'm, I'm not going to quibble. The only comments that I'm going to have really revolve around the interpretation of these results and how those interpretations might affect how we want to treat these um, estimates when we go to aggregation, which is really kind of the important final keystone of this paper. OK, okay so the, the, first, um, the first thing is that there's a distinction in the paper drawn between maintenance and customization in terms of home improvement spending. And so we can think of ma maintenance as basically the replacement of depreciated structure, right? So like, you know, my roof is past its useful life, I've got to replace the roof. Um, and customization is more like alteration of an existing structure in order to suit tastes, right? And, and these have very different implications for aggregation. If it's just maintenance, um, and we see a big response of maintenance spending to turnover, then this is kind of about shifting consumption through time, right? Um, and, and that's not so important for aggregation, right? Like if we think, well, the roof is going to get replaced on average about every 40 years, but you know, every time the house turns over, we'll do a little patch of the roof. Um, but if it's 
customization, then this can have a much bigger effect on aggregation, right? Because if it's like every time we put a new household, a new, um, a new household in a home, they have to completely suit it to their taste, then there's going to be lots of spending that's just related to reallocation of households to houses, OK? Um, but I'm not so sure that the distinction between these two things is as clear um, as it could be in the data. Um, now, I mean, there's obviously some things like replacing a roof that's just about maintenance or replacing an old furnace with a new furnace of the same specs. That's, that's just about maintenance. And that's very common to happen around turnover. Um, but what about replacing kitchen cabinets? So, so part of replacing kitchen cabinets is basically because you know we all have our own tastes in the type of, of face of cabinets. And some of us like really modern stuff. Some of us like really traditional stuff. And that's clearly about customization. But part of this is maintenance. Old cabinets may have just you know, reached the end of their useful life. And my worry here is that the replacement of a depreciated structure is often a really good point of time to implement um, customization. So say I'm four years out. I know I'm probably going to, you know, my kids are about to go to college. And when my kids go to college, I'm going to downsize. And my kitchen is starting to look kind of dingy. And you know, if it were just about maintenance, I'd probably try and update it. I would change my tile countertops to granite countertops. But I know I'm going to sell it, and whoever's going to buy it from me is going to want to choose their own pattern of granite. So I might as well just defer it. And in some sense, these two things are, are somewhat um, commingled. Now, you know, they do some uh, efforts to try and get around this, but I'd like to see like a little bit more on this front. Maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. Now, a, harping a little bit more on this customization thing. Now, suppose a particular household has tastes. Um, kitchens are just kind of an easy thing to, to do uh, to talk about. So I'll talk some more about kitchens. So suppose a particular household has a taste for an updated kitchen, right? And there's kind of, and I know that I'm about to buy a new house. And there's two options, right? I can either buy a fixer upper and, uh, with, that has an outdated, outdated kitchen, and then I can go ahead and customize it to my taste. Or I can buy a house with a newly renovated kitchen, or even better, I can buy like a totally new construction, right? And so just to give some examples of how this could be, I, I took two listings from Mar Vista, which is a neighborhood right next to my neighborhood, which is a little bit more hot than my neighborhood, so it was easy to get these kind of examples of an outdated house. Now, if this looks like your kitchen, please don't uh, take offense that I'm calling it outdated. But you'll see why I'm calling it outdated in a second. It's a perfectly nice kitchen. But in Mar Vista, this house is about 2,500 square feet, and this listing is about 1.6 million. I can guarantee you that whoever buys this house is going to completely gut it and redo this kitchen. Because just a block away, this is what new construction looks like. Now, it's a slightly bigger house, five minutes. But as you can see, I mean, it's not even really new construction. It's just they just added on to make this kitchen. There's like a big difference. Now, it, is your, your house? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, you know, I purposely didn't do my house, although this is my taste. Well, I'll just leave it at that. So my house is not quite that fancy. OK, so but why do I care about this, right? Um, and here's actually where I think they might be understating their results somewhat. Option one is going to show up as spending on home improvement. That's going to be that, you know, in, in this case, it'll be like a $100,000 new permit, right? Option two, and I would sort of say that option one is in, in some sense like I'm buying I buy this house, and then I pay to have the kitchen made look like this. And what I'm really buying is this house. Whereas option two it's gonna sh may show up as spending on the seller, um, but not if the seller is a developer in LLC. I don't think they're going to be in any of your data. And because of that, you could actually be understating the effect of turnover on home improvement spending by the seller. And in some sense, I don't care who spends the money to make the outdated house look like the new house whether or not it's the buyer or the seller's incidence of spending. And I mean, in some sense, the buyer is paying for that renovation. It's just where it's getting accounted for in your data might actually make it look like you're not. And so in some sense, I believe that turnover of housing is probably responsible for a lot of spending on renovation, probably more almost than you're saying. OK. Now, uh, final thing that I would like to see more on is a little bit about the rental market. Um, now, the story is largely about households purchasing goods to furnish a new home. And of course, when you buy a new rental, you're not going to replace the refrigerator. Um, but the general tenor of this story just seems to revolve more on turnover and not necessarily on home purchase in particular. 
Um, and when renters switch units, they often increase in size, they need more furniture, a new flat screen TV, which I think is that audio visual spending that you're picking up, and would, would seem to have a, a similar consumption response, although I'm willing to stipulate it's probably going to be much smaller in value. And so it would just be interesting if you could um, um, see if you could bring some data to bear on turnover in the rental market, and because this kind of has important implications for aggregation. If it's the turnover that's driving the story, then, then turnover is a relevant statistic. So it's like mo houses, households moving from unit to unit, not necessarily just sales. So just to conclude, I, 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 I think this is a really nice paper that covers um, an important channel through which the housing market can affect consumption. Um, I, I have no quibbles at all with identification. Uh, I think it's straightforward and simple and, and, and convinced me. I would just push a little bit on interpretation.